RTD6, the Indie Channel. This is Indianapolis This Week with Rafael Sanchez. Thanks for joining us for Indianapolis This Week. I'm Rafael Sanchez. As we reach the final days of 2014, we're looking back to the stories that made the biggest headlines over the past 12 months. It's hard to imagine a single story taking the spotlight more than the fight over same-sex marriage. It started in January with Governor Mike Pence's State of the State address. So let me say from my heart, no one, no one on either side of this debate deserves to be disparaged or maligned because of who they are or what they believe. Let's have a debate worthy of our people with civility and respect. Let's protect the rights of Hoosier employers to hire who they want and provide them with the benefits that they deserve. And then let's resolve this issue this year once and for all. But that did not happen with the legislature voting to change H.J.R. 3, uh, keeping the constitutional amendment to ban same-sex marriage off the ballot box for the, at least two years. And then in June, a federal judge struck down Indiana's law, declaring it unconstitutional. A strongly worded federal appeals court ruling reached the same conclusion in September. And in October, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear the case, making same-sex marriage the law of the land in the Hoosier state. Now let's welcome our political insiders, Abdul Hakim Shabazz and Dan Parker. We saw what some will consider a tsunami in a, a major social issue. Was this the biggest issue for 2014 as far as being a social issue in our state? I would say yes. Uh, when I came to Indiana, covering Indiana government in 2004, uh, Republicans had run on this issue, saying that same protecting the Constitution and traditional marriage was the highest priority. Just amazing how in the course over a decade, the, the pendulum had shifted and the pendulum had changed, and now same-sex marriage is legal here in Indiana. Just back in 2007, uh, it died in a House committee by one vote and was put left off the ballot because of that action. In the span of seven years, we've moved tremendously, and now that it's legal in Indiana, is really a victory for those that, you know, fought the fight for, for almost 10 years. I spoke to the governor two weeks ago in his office, and he told me that the Supreme Court may want to review this case again, and he believes that the court should allow the states to vote on it. He, he believes that the state should have a referendum on this issue. Would that be a setback? And I should also point out that the governor did say that he will uphold the, the rule of law, so he'll do what the courts say, but there seemed to be a governor who would want to see the states vote on this issue. Well, Mike Pence has always been a, a firm believer in traditional marriage. I mean, that's just who yes. Mike, Mike Pence is. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Matter of fact, the, the longer same-sex marriage stays legal, I think the less likely it is that the courts, if the Supreme Court were to hear this, is going to overturn it, because then you literally have to overturn thousands of marriage and thousands of legal rights and things have already been set, and I don't see that happening by any court, even if they were to go ahead and take this back up. Any changes, Dan? No, it, this is going to move to, it's going to be legal in every state. Um, a marriage in one state needs to be recognized in another state. That's just the way uh, it needs to, to happen. And, you know, we're getting to, we're almost going to get to that point. The marriage between the governor and the school superintendent has not been pretty. <laughs> a lot of bickering between I those. I expect to see them on Jerry Springer or Morty Povich. The way they married on divorce. Yeah. <laughs> right, divorce court. But the governor has sort of put an olive branch. He sort of dismantled his own education agency. But the issue of Superintendent Glenda Ritz uh, being in office, the only Democratic state state holder at, there at the state house remains very contentious. Uh, will there be any love between her and her fellow Republicans? Well, I think that I think the next move is Glenda Ritz's. The governor extended the olive branch by uh, eliminating the career education, career innovation, the, the SESI board. No, okay, fine, Glenda, you say this is obstructionist. Fine, we're taking it off the table now. What are you going to bring? Are you going to be able to run meetings, you know, in the right way? Which is why the governor said, "Hey, you know, part of the problem has been Glenda and the board. So let the board decide, you know, who the chair is going to be." I thought it was odd that Glenda told the told the media that you know she was elected to be the chairman of the board. No, that was put in state statute. What the legislature gives you, the legislature can take away. Dan, was it an olive branch or was it roses with thorns on it? I mean, <laughs> what, what was this thing? It was a double-edged sword. Um, you know, I, I think that this issue will, will move to the back seat if, if in this legislative session we don't see any move uh, to go ahead and further erode uh, the superintendent's power. And it really has to move ahead because at the end of the day, the state spends more than 56% of its budget on education, and we have a million school children that depend on somebody doing the right thing, right, at the end of the day. At some point, these battles need to take a back seat to, you know, what's in the best interest of kids, what's in the best interest of, you know, the education uh, for the entire state, not just in, in public schools, but private schools and, and whatnot, given, but, given all the debate. But you also need a superintendent who's going to be able to do, to do who 
says she wants to do her job will actually do it. Because we saw time and time again this entire year, things were supposed to be done, you know, documents presented, and they were never, ever done because Glenda's office kept dropping the ball. Now, if you do your job, then maybe will people won't have a problem letting you do your job. On the issue of Democrats, you took a beating in the midterm elections. Can I felt for you, my brother. I really can, did. Can you recover? <laughs> I worked down in Kentucky. We won. <laughs> well, can, but can you recover from what was a beatdown of massive proportions in the South that a single U.S. senator is a Democrat? Uh, you, the country is now redder than it's red. Well, that's for a midterm electorate. Um, we're going to be moving towards 2016 uh, presidential electorate. Uh, it's going to be a much larger uh, uh, electorate. Um, you know, in, in Indiana, we've been in these numbers before, uh, and the pendulum usually swings back. Uh, but it's going to take a lot of hard work and, uh, uh, you know, standing for something. Well, when the Chicago Cubs called the Democrats and said, hey, we feel sorry for you for the loss that you take, I mean, that ought to, that ought to tell you something. I mean, the, the, the problem is, I'm, I was so shocked that the Democrats in this midterm election ran away from the president. I mean, if you're going to say, if you talk about, you know, the economy's coming back, you know, gas prices down and blah, blah, why not embrace it? Why not run with it? When, Al, when they asked Allison Grimes, uh, who was running for the Senate against Mitch McConnell, did you vote for the president? And she won't give a straight answer. I mean, well, how do you expect anybody to come out and vote for you when you guys don't even stand by, you know, your man? So who was the biggest winner in 2014? Uh, biggest winner of 2014, I will say, at the state level, uh, state house Republicans. And Chris, there, there are now more Senate Republicans than there are in the entire Democrats in both the House and the Senate. So I got to give those folks credit because they were expected actually to lose a couple seats when, in fact, they actually, actually had a net gain. Do you recover at all at the state house? I mean, they're the same. Another shellacking. Well, I would say the biggest winner for 2014 is actually Joe Hogsett. Um, he went from uh, the Democrats here in Indianapolis went from having a primary to having uh, basically an uncontested primary and now the Republican Party can't even find a candidate to run against him for mayor next year. So he actually is a big winner in 2014. Well, how about the State House, though? How, how were you recovered in that? Because you did lose more seats. You, you, gained, you gained one. There was one Democratic person that was... In, in Madison County. Madison, Madison County. and Delaware County. It's just seat by seat. And you really have to stand, uh, you know, stand up for an agenda and, and play it out in a lot of these seats. Like I said, 2016 is going to be a different year. And hopefully we'll see better voter turnout from the electorate in 2015. Well, he's not in favor of that. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm in favor of an informed voter turnout is what I'm in favor of. If you're informed and you're engaged, then please come out and vote. Otherwise, stay home. You're not doing anybody a favor. Uh, coming up, we look ahead into the new year and the stories that could have the biggest impact on you, including the race to replace Greg Ballard as mayor of Indianapolis. That and much more with Indianapolis This Week returns. Welcome back to Indianapolis this week as Mary Beth and I welcome Laura Beck and Jennifer Hollowell. Let's talk about 2015, the big year for a race in Indianapolis, Mary Beth. Big year for mayor in Indianapolis and the Democrats, it's all Joe Hogsett, Joe Hogsett, and the Republicans. Who? Tell us today. Well, we have we have a handful of candidates, multiple candidates, or potential candidates, uh, folks who are taking a hard look at it from a variety of backgrounds and um, you know I mean it's it's not an easy decision for people to make they want to consult their families so they're taking some time to consider that and uh, you know the party party chairman is leading that effort and I'm I'm confident that we will have a very strong candidate who will be very competitive in next year's mayor's no, race. So far they're all saying no. Jim Merritt said no, Murray Clark said no. You're well, sure somebody's going to say yes. Ben Hunter who's well, competitive. I, I'm absolutely sure that someone will say yes who is competitive, um, without question. You know, there were only a couple of names that were ever public, and there, are, like I said, several names that have never been public. So, Lara, we're five months from process. a primary, less than a year from an right. election. Does someone need to step forward quickly so that they can start the raising of the money and raising their name of visibility and all the things that come with a campaign? Well, yeah, I mean, they do. Um, I, I think that, um, yes, they, they absolutely do. Um, the, the void in having a candidate, though, does allow Joe Hoxett, um, who has you know basically lined up the Democrat support, um, to, to be uncontested right now and to really be that only story out there. Um, the challenge, you know, Know, in running for mayor and, and I mean you can you know this better than anybody is it's a really expensive costly election so whoever gets in if they're not a self-funder on the Republican side um, they're gonna really have to start raising money and start raising money quickly and while Mayor Ballard could always give them a big infusion of cash then they're carrying that load of 
uh, you know, of his of of his term his and, and of him. Well, you think it's his popularity, but I mean, you know, you don't get anybody out there. So what, so what will it take? <laughs> in the 70s. I don't know Since about Joe that. Hawks, that's the only name sort of out there. What right. will it take to beat him? Because currently he is sort of the the guy to beat. Yeah, so far he is like the luckiest man in Indiana politics, well, right? At least everything. of the Democrats. Yeah. I mean, time and he, is, he has it all to himself. And um, in running in a county that is more and more Democratic, so somebody's got to come in either with the kind of every man persona that Greg Ballard really personified or who's already got big name and big money. Yeah. There, I mean, I think there are a couple different profiles of a candidate that work well. Um, but in terms of the, the process, you know, it isn't as if there isn't, uh, there is an infrastructure already in place. And so you're not, you're not starting from scratch. The Ballard campaign has a solid infrastructure. The County Republican Party has a solid infrastructure. There's a lot of data and research and things that are just ready um, for that candidate. So while they'll have to build their own, you know, their own profile and their talking points, all of the kind of back end is is a turnkey operation. Ready Time in, you get one challenge though. One challenge is when you're following um, a two-term incumbent is that sometimes, um, and I don't know what Joe Hogsett's game plan is going to be, but sometimes it's hard to follow in those footsteps. We see that at the state level. Um, we've seen that before in governor's races before. So uh, it will be very interesting to see how it evolves uh, if and when they have somebody come out. Let's head to Washington for just a minute and the new Republican controlled Senate that will take charge in January. Will it be any different than past years? We put that question to Senator Dan Coats. Well, it can't be worse than what we went through in 2013 and 2014. I'm very hopeful that uh, with Republicans in control of the Senate, we're going to be able to pass responsible legislation. Whether or not the president uh, accepts it or not, I can't determine. Uh, I can't read the mind of the president in this. But if we can work with Democrats on bipartisan legislation, it'll be much harder for him to, uh, to deny it. Is that true, or, or is this really a good thing for Democrats to have the Republicans in charge so they can blame somebody? I mean, will this be a blame That's game? That's never a good thing to be solidly in the minority, so I don't think it's a good thing, but I also am not optimistic that things are going to be better because they still have do not have a filibuster-proof majority, and that's been the problem, that a minority has been able to block something, and the minority will still be able to block something. It's interesting right now, too, because there's a school of thought out there that because the president does not have to keep in mind of re-elections or the midterms are over, essentially, that there is a little bit of liberation for him in coming out on some of these issues like immigration and Cuba um, because he doesn't have to worry about an election coming up. So it will be very interesting to see how that shakes out. I mean, I think the Republicans are going to fight him every step of the way, but we'll see. But I, I think that there is uh, incentive for both sides to demonstrate progress and to get some things done for the American people and I think that the president would want in his last couple of years to be able to to add that to his you know kind of book in, in history and Republicans also need to demonstrate progress and and getting things done so I mean I'm I'm more optimistic but certainly it will be challenging. <laughs> well, somebody has. So 2015, glad you are. So 2015 what do you think will be the big story will it be this mayor's race will it be the legislature will it be preparing for a presidential race what will be uh, the, the big story in 2015. Um, well, definitely, I think politically the mayor's race, but also um, it'll be whether Mike Pence gets into the race for president or sits it out, whether um, how they manage the budget next year will be a little more difficult. The revenue is not coming quite as great as they thought. On the other hand, they do still have a surplus so that they've got money, but nobody ever thinks of the budget as the big story unless it's a total implosion. So I think mayor's race and Mike Pence. Ten seconds each. Biggest story for 2015 will be mayor's race. Race, president? Uh, I, I, can I just agree with... Uh, you can agree. You can agree. <laughs> yes. She loves to be agreed upon. I, I, say, I say Pence and I say Mayor's race. Uh, coming up, we talk about the next 12 months for Governor Mike Pence and the looming decision about a run for a second term or the White House. Next on Indianapolis This Week. Welcome back to Indianapolis This Week. Let's move to the year ahead in state government. And it almost certainly starts with the future for Governor Pence. He told us last week that he will decide after the legislative session if he's running for re-election or for president of the United States. Now his wife is giving us a glimpse at the discussions taking place. Let's get that from State House reporter Katie Hines. 
We recently visited the governor's residence for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with First Lady Karen Pence and a look at the heralded holiday decorations. Mrs. Pence shared details about her family's Christmas traditions. She and her husband will spend the holiday in Israel with their three college-age children. But the First Lady also provided a glimpse into the potential big decision ahead for her family. The governor has said he'll take time to reflect on the idea of running for president and he'll discuss it with his wife and kids. He's told both local and national media that he believes public service is a calling and his wife reiterated that point but she also painted perhaps the clearest picture yet of where the Pences stand right now. I think that is a calling and at present we don't feel called to that. Um, we really are focusing on Indiana right now. You know, he's getting ready to start the long session coming up in January. And so when I look at that, and I know all the issues they're dealing with and all the things they're trying to accomplish. We're not even thinking about looking at that until until after the session is over. It's the first time we've heard her or the governor say that at the present they don't feel called. Raphael, back to you. Katie, thank you so much. He, this family is what a faith that he's also mentioned that he's going to pray about it once the session is over. So what happens? Do you think that that prayer will be answered and he will run or does he not run? I, I really can't answer that right now, but I do think the fact that Karen Pence is publicly talking about it is such a 180 from what we saw with Sherry Daniels, the previous first lady and the discussions to get Mitch Daniels into the race. She was against it. She did not do interviews about it. There was no um, opening like she's giving that this is something that the family is already talking about, thinking about uh, at least setting a date sure. for when they'll get into it. I, I have to say, you know, it, I had a flashback to when I worked for uh, former First Lady Maggie Kernan because there were some times where she inadvertently or inadvertently made news about her husband's political future um, while I was standing there watching her do it. Um, so I, I would say that Karen Pence is a really ter terrific and tremendous ambassador for Governor Pence. Um, and I agree with Mary Beth that it's very interesting that she's entertaining these, these questions. Um, and having her out there there talking about the session, talking about his future is a smart move by them because mm -hmm. I would imagine she's pretty popular in Indiana right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, no one can predict what that decision will be, but it's always a good thing if your governor is being uh, considered by others across the country as, you know, presidential material. I mean, that's that's a compliment to him and to our state and the progress that uh, that we've made over recent years. And I mean, I think we should be happy about that, that we have a governor that so many people want to see run for president. Also a commentary perhaps on the rest of the Republican field. There is no clear front runner, no one person that's scaring off other people from sure. getting in the, the race. Yeah, the, there's the, not a clear front runner. And even if there were, I mean, we, we saw uh -huh. certainly on a presidential race that I worked on in 2008, um, who the front runner was a year out right, or exactly. two years out yeah. was completely Doesn't, different yeah, and changed, you know, three or four times. And, and you know, the thing about about Governor Pence is, is that he's been in D.C., so he understands how it works, and he certainly has many of his alums are lining up in some pretty high high profile and high powered networks um, to put together something for him. So while he's deciding and while they're praying and while they're spending some time going to Israel and making foreign policy speeches, that network is at least being assembled for him in the event he wants to. When do someone it. like Jeb Bush says I'm running I'm thinking about running for president do the others just say another Bush there's no way I can even run I mean th no they're saying another Bush I don't see why I can't run because yeah, exactly. you've had two Bushes a third okay. is going to be too many plus he's got a lot of baggage not only from his brother but okay. from his own administration and common well, core and, uh, yeah. these yeah. candidates or potential candidates appeal to different to, mm -hmm. to different folks yeah. within the Republican Very party different folks. and and so it fires some people up at one way or the other sure. when you see it an announcement legislature like the legislature returns to work in a, in a matter of days they have a lot of to worry about and there's a budget, we have a surplus, but there also revenues were not as expected when December ended. I mean, where's this gonna, what's that going to look like? You've covered the legislature for years, so you know that w you budget know, sessions are not easy. And one um, House Ways and Means chairman once told me that it was almost worse to have a surplus than to have a, a no money, because if there's a surplus, everybody thinks that they ought to get a cut of it. And yet, there's more wants and more needs than that surplus is ever going to make up, especially since revenues did not come 
come in to where they wanted them to. Luke Kenley, who's the Senate Appropriations Chairman, he's already said this is going to be one of the hardest budgets he's ever dealt with. You have 30 seconds, ladies. We'll split the time. I think you'll see some also some political posturing going on <laughs> around the budget because you got a lot of folks in that state house that want to run for governor. You got the last word. There's going to be a lot of focus on education and funding mm -hmm. that is a top priority for the governor and also for Republicans in the House. Happy New Year to all Happy three New of you. Year. I look Happy forward to working with you in 2015. Great. Thank Happy you. Please Thank come you. on back. <laughs> well, think yes. about it. <laughs> 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 the conversation between our insiders continues on Twitter. Check out their Twitter handles and give us your opinion. They have plenty of opinions, so come on. We want to hear from you. And stay up to date with them, Lara, Jennifer, and Mary Beth. They want to hear from you right now. Indianapolis This Week continues after the break. this week and we want to make sure that you welcome in the new year with RTV6 with the world's biggest and greatest New Year's Eve celebration. It's New Year's Rockin' Eve live from Times Square in New York City featuring the one and only Taylor Swift and other great musical guests. It's hosted by Ryan Seacrest. The big party starts at 8 o'clock and goes through the night including the much anticipated ball drop that happens at midnight. Thank you for joining us today and all year here at Indianapolis this week. We promise to continue to watch all of the year's biggest stories right here and make sure that you get your questions to, from the city's top leaders in 2015. For all of us here at RTV6, have a great new year and we hope to see you in 2015. And remember that we are always on theindychannel.com, our website, and on the RTV6 app. Happy New Year. We'll see you again in 2015. Thank you for watching.